Thank you all for coming tonight. Bernie and Mary, it's so wonderful to see you all. I've been knowing Bernie and Mary for a number of years. They've been real close friends. They're from Michigan and have now come to Seattle, and you're fortunate in this area. Uh, Bernie is just one of the greatest preachers you've ever heard, not only a song leader. It's uh, wonderful. In the eighth chapter of Romans, beginning with verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let us bow our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. It's been such a beautiful day today, and especially to be able to live with you in it. We thank you for all who are ours in you. We thank you that we belong to all through you. Thank you for this church, for the beauty of its natural setting. Most of all, for the people that make up this church. For letting us all come together tonight for this beautiful hymn that's been sung for the one who brought it to us. And we've come, Lord, to see beyond man. We've come to see you. We've come to hear you. We've come to receive that which you have prepared for us. Divest our minds, our hearts, of all that would block or hinder Quicken that within us, which would reach out and appropriate that which you are offering. Make us glad. Make us expectant as we sit before thy throne. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I said this morning that I'm not preaching any new doctrine, and this is true. But I also said this morning that we come seeking to have new experiences and gain new insights in old truths. Truth is old, you know. It's as old as God, for God is truth. There is nothing new under the sun. This is truth. We just discover it in fresh ways. And this is certainly true concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is here in our midst tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit to make all things new. And I do hope you've come expectantly. We have back in North Carolina a Quaker uh, community there where I live in Wayne County. We have some other Quaker communities in the state. But a few years ago there was a Quaker preacher, a lady uh, who was a sort of a lay preacher but nevertheless spoke a lot of the old Quaker churches. And one morning she spoke and thought she had done unusually good. And after the service, one of the laymen came up and said, Mrs. Hollowell, I don't believe you were quite up to par this morning. <laughs> uh, 
Well, it uh, shocked her a little bit, but not to be outdone, she looked at him and said, Brother, perhaps thee didst not bring anything to put it in. <laughs> So I hope you brought something to put it in. <laughs> and I think what we could bring to put it in is expectancy. We come to Jesus expecting something to happen to us. I know of nothing that describes the sort of attitude to which I'm referring better than this story told by Jordan Groom. Jordan is pastor of the Polk Street Methodist Church over in Amarillo, Texas. Wonderful preacher, great man of God. And said one morning, when the people began to come into the sanctuary, the usher stood, instead of giving each person a bulletin of the service, they gave everyone a hen egg that had been colored. Stamped on the egg was the word, hallelujah. And of course the people took it, they had no alternative. <laughs> and came on in and sat. <laughs> there they were, each one holding an egg. And of course, when the pastor came to lead the service, uh, their expressions demanded an explanation. Uh, so he said, friends, you've been coming to church Sunday after Sunday for years. Our bulletins have been describing everything that was to happen. You know exactly when the choir's going to stand and when you stand. When the choir's going to sit and when you sit. You know when the preacher's going to start and when he's going to stop. You know everything that's going to happen before it ever happens. And so, consequently, you've come expecting nothing. But he said this morning, instead of having a bulletin, you've been given a hen egg. And he said, as you sit there, if you hold that egg just right, something might happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that describes something of the attitude a person comes before God. Not with just a preconceived idea about what will or will not happen, but as if you're having an egg that might hatch any moment. Something might happen. So uh, we will uh, look to the Lord in these services with that expectancy. I am happy to report to you perhaps something you already know. And that is that in our day, we are undergoing something of tidal waves of the life of the Holy Spirit. The church of Jesus Christ is being rebaptized in the Holy Spirit. This is happening. It is happening in every denomination that I know anything about. It is happening all over the world. It is nothing that is peculiarly related to one segment of the church geographically doctrinally or otherwise. In our Methodist church, we are undergoing a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Men in high and low places are having these experiences. Prayer groups are being formed. Retreats are being experienced. Breakthroughs in church levels and indiv on individual levels are being experienced and all up and down this land. And I said the Methodist Church because I happen to know more about it than I do otherwise. But the same thing is happening in other denominations as well. And I think that all of us need to have an ever-expanding understanding of what we mean when we talk about the life and person of the Holy Spirit. It is not a matter, you see, will we have revival? We're having revival. Now, and if you are not having revival, you're missing out. If you aren't having new experiences in the Holy Spirit, you're missing out. God is moving by His Spirit in our day. Miracles are happening in our day. Miracles of healing, in terms of great physical miracles, I have seen as many miracles in the last six months of miraculous healing as any recorded in the Bible. Happening in our day, 
People are coming into realms of new insight and power in our day, equal to any that's happening in the Bible. People are having the inflow and breakthrough of the life of the Holy Spirit, as much so as anything recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. God is moving by His Spirit. And so I come to you and with you here this week that we might somehow so yield ourselves to the Lord that we can have done within us and through us the work that is commensurate with our deepest need and with his highest pleasure concerning us. And so tonight, I would like to share with you something of what I think the church means when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, you heard me read tonight these words, for as many as are led by the Holy Spirit, they are the sons of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This eighth chapter of Romans was John Wesley's text all the way through his ministry. I do not remember reading a sermon of John Wesley, and I've read many, when one way or another he doesn't refer to something from the eighth chapter of Romans. This is the heart of that experience that gave Methodism birth. It's the heart of the experience that gives any Christian birth. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you stand in your church and say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, you are making a confession of faith, not only to those around you, but to the whole world. What do you mean? What are you saying? Certainly, aren't we saying, among other things, when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, aren't we saying that we believe Behind this outward and visible world, there is an inward and invisible power. Don't, don't we really believe, when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, that the ultimate power of the universe that brings everything into being that exists is spirit? That not, not the materialistic order is that which not counts, but this is simply a reflection of it. We believe we're saying that God made the world out of nothing. And the Spirit of God moved over the deep. And by the power of the Spirit, God brought forth that which is. We, we're saying we believe that ultimate reality is the hidden quality of life that exists within everything that breathes, and yet it's invisible and can never be fitted into the mold of human form in terms of outward concept. But the outward finds its meaning only as it gives fulfillment to that inward. To use a theological term, we are saying we believe in the sacramental nature of all life. That's what we're saying when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the sacramental nature of all life. You see, we say a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. All of life is this. All, the whole universe is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible power. And so we as Christians are saying, when we believe in the Holy Spirit, that that which is real is invisible, and that which is seen is temporal. And so we're calling men to have eyes to see the invisible. We're saying that which really counts is somehow to have ears to hear the inaudible. Somehow to know that one who cannot be known except by revelation from within. And we're saying to all of the world, at the center of life, there's a holy hush. Be still and know that I'm God. We're saying we believe in that 
which cannot be seen as ultimate reality. But we're saying something more than this. We're not only saying we believe that the real world is the invisible world, the world of spirit. But we're saying if you want to know the secrets to the outward and visible world, then tap into the laws of the inward and invisible world. You see, we Christians are not people who are running away from the physical into the spirit. Not that at all. We're not running away trying to get off to heaven somewhere. That's not the movement of the church. We are saying we believe that the way this world in its outward order operates can be discovered by learning to live the life of the spirit. And this is the reason we point with pride to those stories in our scripture that reveal this truth. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was a man that had to do, and is a man, that has to do with this world order. He wasn't just, and is not just a little religious figure that floated around talking about theological truths. Jesus Christ was and is down to earth and has to do with these issues that affect man. What is more down to earth than taxes? <laughs> you say, uh, well, well, now, did you, uh, did you ever think that Jesus was concerned with taxes? Well, he is. The fellows came to him one day and said, Jesus, are you going to pay your taxes? Well, I hadn't thought much about it, he said. But since you brought it up, yes, we'll pay our taxes. Uh, go down and catch us a fish. And in the fish, you'll find money. Take the money and go pay our tax. Well, now, some people have tried to water that story down. And they've said that the disciples went down and caught a fish and sold the fish. And what they got from the sale of the fish paid taxes. Well, either the size of fish, you see, have decreased a great deal. <laughs> our taxes have gone up tremendously, or maybe both, if that's the way it was. If you don't mind, I'll just take my miracle straight. I'm serious. I believe Jesus Christ mastered a spiritual law. And through mastering a spiritual law, manifested victory as complete exercising dominion over the same way with multiplying the fish and the loaves. Here were a group of people. They had sat and heard him talk. And they were hungry. And Jesus knew they were hungry. And these disciples, you could hear them, they were so pious. And saying, Jesus, let them do without food. After all, you fed them spiritually, and that's what counts. Don't ever run off with that sort of idea about Christianity. Christianity is not merely concerned with a man's soul. Christianity is concerned with man as a whole being. Christianity is concerned with mind, with spirit, with body. And Jesus Christ never says, you do without the physical in order to make your spirit sweeter. That's not the gospel. I grew up somehow believing it was, but it's not. I heard good people say, God put me on my back so I'd have to look up. As if sickness was a virtue, and God visited the physical body with sickness so our souls would be sweeter. You don't find that in the New Testament, friends. That's foreign to the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And when these people were hungry physically, Jesus Christ said to the disciples, seat them in groups of 50. And they set them in groups of 50 on the clumps of grass, Jesus called the little boy who had brought his lunch and took these loaves and fish and began to break. And as he blessed and break, he multiplied. Can, can you imagine anything more thrilling than to see these fish and loaves multiplied with every break as Jesus fed? How did he do it? He had discovered a spiritual law. And in mastering the spiritual law, he manifested that victory in the natural. 
the spiritual truths you learn, whatever they are, are really not valid until you learn to express them in the natural order. When we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, we're not only saying we believe in a spiritual order, but we're saying we are learning to master those spiritual laws so we can manifest them in the natural. For Christianity is a marriage of heaven and earth. It's a marriage of the spiritual and physical, of the word and flesh, of heaven and earth, of man and God. And so we are saying we believe that this outward world is made in such a way that it can best be used as it reveals the life of the Spirit. Now this is one of the great things that's happening in our day. It's one reason I know this Pentecost in which we are in is valid. I'm discovering businessmen who are learning to make money by obeying God. Did you know that God knows how to make money? He really does. And you know, I used to think that you shouldn't mention that word in church. You know, after all, that's what you talk about six days a week. And for God's sake and for the world's sake, let's not talk about it when we get to church. And I lived in fear and somehow thought that you were supposed to. If you were religious, somehow you were supposed to have grace to do with that. And I used to hear good people say about preachers, well, preacher, if you'll stay humble, we'll keep you poor. And they'd laugh as if there's some great virtue in being poor. I don't believe it. I really don't, and I'm not discovering that as my walk in the Spirit. I had great fear about finances, and I still have some. Once in a while, I find it uh, creeping up within me. But as I give myself to the Holy Spirit, I'm finding through obedience to the Spirit a fulfillment of materialistic needs. And I find that God is infinitely interested in teaching me how to appropriate all things that I need. And I'm finding not only this true for myself, but businessmen all over this world as they learn to operate their business through prayer and through the life of the Holy Spirit. Regardless of what your work might be, let me give you a wonderful secret. Jesus knows more about it than you do. <laughs> Isn't that simple? Regardless of what your work is, Jesus Christ knows more about it than you do. And he's able to run it just a little better than you are. And if you will start turning your business over to Jesus Christ, you will discover wonderful secrets. First of all, you'll find that you don't have to worry about it. And wouldn't that be a great load off your shoulders? Not to have to worry about the job you're doing, but to realize Jesus can do it better than you. When I discovered this about preaching, I don't know that anybody got blessed anymore. I'm sure I didn't preach any better sermons if it's good. But friends, I sure do enjoy my preaching. <laughs> Really, it's a sight. The difference is made so far as I'm concerned. To realize that this preaching business is not mine. I don't have to stand up here and impress you. I don't have to take you by the neck and shake you. But that this business is Jesus' business. And if he's not in this, then we're just wasting our times. But if he is in it, we can rely on him and just have a wonderful time while we're doing it. It's amazing. And I'm finding this is true in every walk of life. I have a friend of mine named Harold Hill over in Baltimore, Maryland. Harold is an electrical engineer. He's a graduate student of Lehigh University. He, he and two other fellows own the Curtis, I believe it's Curtis Machine Company or something like that. Anyway, Curtis is connected with the name over in Baltimore. And they are mostly advisors in the field of electrical engineering. And some time ago, after Hal had come into this walk in the Lord, the engineers from the city of Baltimore called Hal and said, one of our plants out here is broken down. Our engineers can't find the trouble. Uh, could your company come out and work with us on it? And Hal accepted the invitation. And going out to the plant, he said, now, Jesus, those boys out there know much more about that plant than I. I I'm not particularly 
uh, familiar with that kind of plant. So I realize you're giving me an opportunity to witness. And he said, Lord, you know more about it than those city engineers. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll listen to you. You tell me where the trouble is, and I'll give you the glory. <laughs> <laughs> so Hal, Hal went out, and uh, he looked over the blueprints with the fellows. They showed, they showed him what they had done and hadn't done. And while Hal was looking over the blueprints, an idea came to his mind. Well, he thought to himself, this is so simple, I know they've taken care of that. And he went on, didn't even ask him about it. Went on, and uh, after a while, that idea came back. And this time, the Lord whispered to Hal's heart and said, why don't you listen? <laughs> so old Hal stopped everything, went over to the place where this voice was indicating within his heart, and did whatever needed to be done, a very simple little thing, and the machines picked up just like that. And there the engineer stood with their mouths open and said, How? How in the world did you think about that? How said you've asked, and everybody's entitled to an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told them the story. And after he told them, walked out, left the boy standing there, wondering what had hit them. Jesus is in the business world. And he's moving in the business world by the power of his spirit. Men discovering new secrets. Let me tell you a story I recently heard uh, talking about business. Over in Denver, Colorado, uh, there's a, a preacher named Charles Blair. Been there about 18 years. I think his church is one of the largest in Denver. Uh, this happened a few months ago within the past year. One, And he's a great man of God. One night in the middle of the night, he awoke from a dream. It gripped his heart. And he woke his wife and said, Ruth, I think her name was Ruth, uh, I had a dream. I, it somehow, it's, it's vivid, and I, I must tell you about it. She said, darling, go back to sleep. <laughs> and so she wouldn't listen until the next morning. And after she, he told her the next morning, I uh, said, I've got to tell you this dream. And I said, I've been awake all night, and I just can't shake it. Well, what is it, Charles? He said, do you know this property? And he described it, uh, the, a building that wasn't quite complete, and the man who had been building it died, and Charles had had the funeral. She said, yes, I, I know that property. Well, he said, last night I dreamed that was a hospital, and I saw my, my study on the top floor. And he said, somehow I can't shake that dream. She said, Charles, we've had dreams before. They come and go. Forget it. <laughs> so uh, he saw that she wasn't listening. And he just kept it in his heart and it continued to live with him. And he knew it was the Lord speaking by spirit through a dream. Don't you believe in dreams? Well, don't read your New Testament if you don't. Do you realize every major event in the life of Jesus is related, our dream is related to it? Do you realize the Gentile church is a church because of a dream that Paul saw a man from Macedonia saying in the dream, come over and help us, we cry. If you don't believe in dreams, stay out of the New Testament. You see, God speaks to the subconscious when we're asleep. God speaks in these dreams. The Holy Spirit is alive and is at work. And so Charles kept continuing with this dream four days. On the fourth day, a real estate man came to see him and said, Charles, I feel foolish coming to you this way. But he said, I have an idea, and it's bugging me. You see, this is the way a real estate man talks. <laughs> a preacher would say, I have a dream. It's inspiring me. <laughs> I have an idea. It's bugging me. What is it? He said, I must show you a piece of property in this town. All right, he said, show it to me. So they got in the car. You know where the man took him to this un incompleted building. And the real estate man said, Charles, I don't know why I'm showing it to you, because it's not for sale. Uh, two boys, the sons of this man, uh, aren't uh, even interested in putting it on the market. But he said, somehow, I had to show it to you. Then Charles told him about the dream. The real estate man said, well, let's go see the boys. And they went around and found one of the boys 
And when they told him what had happened about the dream and about the idea, this old boy stood there trembling and said, this has to be God. He said, four days ago, my brother and I were talking about this building. And my brother said, I'd be willing to sell that building if Charles Blair would buy it and turn it into a hospital. <laughs> uh, so Charles, uh, being an influential preacher, I uh, got some money together from friends and got, formed a corporation, and they bought this building. Now he began to look around for a doctor to head it up. Someone told him about Dr. Bob Johnson out here on the West Coast. So Charles called and made an appointment with Bob Johnson. Flying out west on the plane, he was doodling on the back side of an envelope and wrote down the words, I mean the word life, L-I-F-E. Shaded it, you know, and looked at it and it sort of blessed him. Made him feel good down on the inside just as he looked at it. He didn't know what it meant. Put it in his pocket and went on. And when he got to see Dr. Bob Johnson, uh, Dr. Bob said, Charles, I used to have a dream about something of this kind, a Christian hospital, uh, where everything was geared to prayer. But he said, I'm in partnership now with these other men. The Lord is blessing us. I'm having a good Christian ministry. And I don't think I'm interested in what you're saying here about this. So uh, Charles thanked him and said, but incidentally, Bob, before I go, you might be interested, he said, somehow it blessed me. He said, I believe this word has something to do with the name of our hospital. And showed him that envelope with the word life written on it. Dr. Bob Johnson began to tremble. And then he broke down and said, Charles, I had a dream of a hospital of this kind. I really had given it up because I thought God had something else for me. But he said, this is God because the name God had given me for my hospital was the Life Center. The Life Center. Bob Johnson is in Denver now heading up this new hospital. Now this is business. What could be more business than a building and establishing and bringing together a hospital? The Holy Spirit know how to do things? Of course. And that's what we're saying. When we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, we're saying we believe that there's a hidden order, invisible, but also that as we discover the laws of the invisible order, life of the Spirit, these laws teach us how to operate in the physical order. But we're saying more than this. We're also saying that we as individuals know our true selves and really come to our fulfillment as we are possessed by the Holy Spirit. Have you actually met yourself yet? Do you know who you are? Do you? You do not know who you are except as you are possessed by the Holy Spirit. You are greater than you could ever dream yourself to be. You are of more of an infinite worth that you can ever imagine by the farthest stretch of your mind. You are capable of higher heights, of greater mastery than you've ever known or ever dreamed of knowing that can never be realized unless you give yourself to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. I'm finding this true in my own life. I know that my present level of experience is not even in kindergarten compared to what I'm going to be. But friends, if my life was snuffed out now and going back to the ground was like a leaf dying and becoming fertilizer for another tree, if that's all it was, I'd take these 12 or 14 years that I've had in the life of the Spirit over a thousand years in any other existence just for the sheer thrill of walking in the Spirit. I never dreamed life could be so wonderful. I never dreamed there was so much fulfillment. I never dreamed that the thoughts of your heart could be released and you could see these dreams as they began to shape, materialize, and you lift, were lifted to that level where you knew you were a co-creator with God. Bringing into existence by the power of the Spirit.
things that never were, except in your own heart, hidden down in your soul someplace. And by the power of the Spirit, you are able to bring them out, let them be conceived in love, released in faith, and brought forth as an act of obedience that blessed the whole universe, a co-labor with God. And we, as human beings, are saying to the world, we believe ourselves to have been made for the Holy Spirit. My mind functions best, whatever it may be. <laughs> My mind functions best when it's given over to the life of the Holy Spirit. Your body, your physical body, functions best as it's anointed by the Holy Spirit. Your body's made for the Holy Spirit. Now, look, look at what's happening here. Uh, so you fellows, suppose you went down to the garage for an oil change. And as the, uh, the garage man changed your oil and was pouring it all back into the crankcase, you said to him, wait just a minute, Charlie. Before you put the cap on the crankcase, how about dropping me in a handful of sand? How long would your car last? Doesn't it almost make you cringe uh, to think about a fistful of sand in the crankcase of a car? <laughs> sand in gears that are made for oil? What do you think your body is made for? What about your emotions? What do you get happy about? What makes you happy? Do you rejoice in things that rejoice the heart of God? Is that what you're happy about? What makes you mad? <laughs> Do you get mad at the things God gets mad at, if he does? And I'm sure he does. <laughs> Is it? Oh, what makes you mad? What makes you glad? What about your emotional life? Do you know what it is to have the Holy Spirit shed abroad in your heart, the love of God, to sweep over your soul and bring peace and joy and relinquishment? Can you imagine a body like ours that's made for the Holy Spirit and about the time the Lord wants to release the Holy Spirit within us and actually give us great love, we drop in a handful of sand? How do we do that? All right, we, we come to church. We stand and sing these great hymns together. My faith looks up to thee, thy Lamb of Calvary. And we yield ourselves to God. We get the benediction. And then we start out the door. And before we get home, the kids in the back seat have started acting up. About the time we were listening to the news report. And in spite of all this dedication... And in all this all of the Spirit, we lose our temper. <laughs> you see? And there's the sand. Or about the time you think you've, you have everything planned for your next check, the first of the month rolls around, and your wife really didn't pay for that hat. She charged it. <laughs> and you didn't know about it. And in the meantime, you've gotten the fishing rod. <laughs> that, that, that's, and here we are made for the Holy Spirit. Is it any wonder we're sick? Is it any wonder? Well, if we're made for, if we're made for God, should not the church be yielded and given over to a ministry of healing? I think yes. And when we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, we're saying, we believe your body, your mind, your soul is made for the Spirit of God. Would you be home? Come to our fellowship. Come to our service. Come to our worship. And we will release there by faith this love of God that will make you whole and set you free. You see? For we're made for the Holy Spirit. And it means also we're saying, Lord, I'll repent quickly of anything in my mind, spirit, or body that's not given to me by the Holy Spirit. I'm made for the Holy Spirit. 
I wish I could tell you I don't sin anymore. I guess I do. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you this. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> uh, really, I've learned. I'm spoiled for anything else but, but heaven. I can't stand any other kind of spirit. I can lose my temper and get sick like that. If I want to end up with a first-class cold, and if any of you have a cold, don't feel guilty. <laughs> this is just me. If I want to end up with a first-class cold, all I have to do is to lose my temper at home. And I'll catch a cold like that. My body, you see, has been made sensitive by the Holy Spirit. And I'm not made for, for ill temper. I'm made for good temper. And when I get out of whack, I have to repent quickly. And as I repent, the Holy Spirit releases and brings me to fulfillment. Now, I have to close, but let me say just one other thing or so. We're saying also when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, we're saying we have discovered through the Spirit a new basis of fellowship, of, of belonging to one another. And isn't that something the world needs to discover? What makes you belong to other people? Well, now, the world has discovered economic laws. You belong to people because they make about the same amount of money you make. The world has discovered cultural laws. You belong to other people because uh, they've read the, uh, uh, the same book on bridge you've read. Or you belong to a group of people because they're football enthusiasts and so are you. Or you belong to a group of people because they voted for Mr. Goldwater. And you did too. <laughs> or did you? Yes, or you belong to a group of people because uh, they are white. Or because uh, they are Negro. You see, that the world has found certain ways of describing its relationship to one another. But when we say we belong and we believe to the, in the Holy Spirit, we are saying we've discovered a new basis of relationship. And that is our basis is not economically, politically, culturally, geographically, racially, denominationally, but our basis of fellowship is the Holy Spirit himself. And we as Methodists have a keen heritage at this point for John Wesley was the one who expressed it when he said, not if thy skin be as mine, or if your pocketbook be as mine, or your politics be as mine, but he said, if thine heart be as mine, give me thine head. If thine heart be as mine, give me thine head. And so we're saying to the world, look at us world, we are a church of Jesus Christ. We do not have church members because they're wealthy or poor. They're intelligent or ignorant. They are this or that. We have members in our fellowship simply on the basis of the reality of God's spirit. And we have learned to discover that the thing that holds us together and makes us belong to one another is the Holy Ghost who sheds abroad in our hearts the love of God. Anything less than this is a denial of this truth. And the last thing I want to say is this. When we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, we are saying we have discovered for ourselves a, an unfathomable resource of strength on which we rely day by day for the very breath that we breathe. A Christian is a person any person, just any old person will do. A Christian is an ordinary person living in an ordinary world, doing ordinary things in an extraordinary manner because he's found a superhuman power. And that power is none other than the Holy Spirit himself. And we are saying here, that our fulfillment is not based on circumstances. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. My joy 
is not dependent on whom I might, with whom I might be or what I might have or have not. My joy, my power, my life is within. By the power of the Spirit of God and what can separate me from the Holy Spirit? Can any circumstance? Can any person? Can anything or any creature, height or depth, Things present or things to come, principalities or powers, even death itself. What can separate me? I'm persuaded with Paul that nothing can separate me. For I have within my very being, as the heart of me, the breath of God himself by the Holy Ghost. And naught shall separate me, for I'm his forever. This to me is a part of what we mean when we talk about the life of the Spirit. Let us pray. As you sit there before the Lord, right where you are, as you are, will you breathe deeply all the way down and as you breathe, will you just thank God, the Holy Spirit, for coming within you, taking full possession of you, of your mind, of your spirit, of your body,